One day in the clinic, you see a curious patient who asks what is on the horizon for her degenerative eye condition to possibly grow new cells in her retina. She's also drinking her fourth yellowish green colored sugary beverage for the day. She asks you if she should cut out her drinking of this tonic due to the food colorings used. Well, you don't know, um, but you do remember that Weber State University is researching both of these things as we speak. Welcome everyone to the podcast of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society. Today, we have a unique opportunity to interview some of our very own researchers in Ogden. Um, and kind of about their latest studies, and really we can dive into some possibilities for future patient care. Please note that the opinions and ideas shared on this podcast are those of the speakers, not the opinions of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society or its board. While medical topics will be discussed, it is not to be taken as strict medical advice, and individual clinical judgment is warranted in applying information to patient care. It is the responsibility of the listener to judge for themselves the applicability of the information discussed with regards to their medical practice. I'm Scott Moore. Um, I am a professor at Weber State University, professor of medical laboratory sciences, and I do some clinical research in lifestyle medicine. We also have our another co-host, Brian. So I'm Brian Campbell. I'm part of the residency faculty here at McKady Hospital in Family Medicine and also still seeing patients. Despite the gradual loss of my hair, I'm still active in seeing patients. And we also have as guests today, Dr. Elizabeth Sandquist. She is a professor at Weber State University in zoology and received her postdoctoral fellow at Iowa State University and her PhD at the University of North Dakota. Dr. Sandquist's interests are focused on the area of neuroscience and stem cell research, with an emphasis on the role of the cellular environment. She has performed research using cell culture, mice, zebrafish, um, and all those different types of models. Dr. Sandquist's long-term research objective is to explore how the environment affects repair of the brain and the eye. This knowledge will aid in the development of novel stem cell therapies for the treatment of diseases such as traumatic brain injury, stroke, glaucoma, and macular degeneration. Dr. Sandquist investigates neural repair using zebrafish. Zebrafish have the capacity to regenerate following injury, while neural repair is quite limited in mammals. Now, one of the greatest challenges to stem cell therapies is the proper integration of transplanted cells. With the use of transgenic zebrafish, she hopes to characterize changes in the microenvironment that promote the mitigation and survival of neural stem cells in zebrafish for the application of stem cell transplantation therapies in humans. You know, she also paints really cool science-themed art, which I, I really also am enjoying, but on a different part of my brain, right? But tell us a little bit more about this exciting phenomenon with the zebrafish. I've always been interested in the brain and stem cells and regeneration. And I did a postdoc at Iowa State University in the lab of Don Sakaguchi. And his research, uh, he does a lot of cell culture research looking at how stem cells interact with their environment and different types of biomaterials in collaboration with engineers. And then down the hall, there was a professor that worked with zebrafish. And zebrafish are great for studying development because they're very small and you can also um, immobilize them and put them under the microscope for hours at a time. And so you can see processes occurring in real time. So he was studying uh, development of the vascular system but he and my advisor decided, you know, that might be a cool opportunity for collaboration to look at aspects of stem cell regeneration in the nervous system using zebrafish. And I knew that I wanted to eventually work at a university that had a high focus on undergraduate teaching and research. And so here at Weber State University, I get to work with students um, and they are integral to accomplishing our research aims. I have Benjamin Packard here. If you wanna share a little bit about what you're studying and kind of where you are in your schooling. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, so I am a pre-med student. Right now, I'm in my third year of uh, undergraduate studies. I study microbiology. And 
my interest peaked in, in neuroscience and vision and eyes when I, I took my initial neuroscience class with uh, Dr. Sandquist. Um, she mentioned that she was doing research using zebrafish and looking into um, retinal repair using zebrafish. And I, I said, that is interesting. I love that. I love eyes. I love all things ophthalmology. And I know that things are going, we don't know everything about eyes. We don't know everything about the diseases or how to cure some of these diseases. So I thought it might be a unique opportunity to maybe add to the field and, and learn and grow a little bit more with respect to research and, and eyes and vision. Mm -hmm. Tell them a little bit about what else you do outside of school, where you work. So outside of school, I, I work at McKady Hospital right now. I'm an EKG tech. Um, I've been there for a year and a half, and um, I just love the medical field. I love all things science, and I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so we wanted to uh, take advantage of the ability of ze of that we have from zebrafish of viewing cells in time, how they move and how they behave. And so while zebrafish and humans don't look very similar, they actually have all the same neurons in their retinas and their eyes. One key difference that they can regenerate after injury. And this is true not only for the visual system, but also for a variety of other tissues. Um, so if you like to fish, uh, maybe you'll feel a little bit better about catch and release. <laughs> you can clip a fish fin and it'll regrow within a month. Um, they can have a brain injury damage, brain damage, and if you look at the tissue, uh, you know, a month or two later, you can't even tell that there was injury there. Uh, whereas in our brains, we lose neurons that don't come back, and we also have development of scar tissue. I've always had an interest in how cells interact with their environments. We spent a lot of time in school learning about the insides of cells, but not a lot about how they interact with their surroundings. And so um, my specific focus that I look at is how cells' environments impact their behavior, particularly in relation to migration. And so our goal is to use the zebrafish to visualize these stem cells and track where they go from where they're born to where they end up. And then we can start to uh, manipulate their environment you know, using different mutant fish or inhibitors to look at how that impacts their migratory ability. And so um, if we can understand the ways that these cells migrate to their final destinations, perhaps we could use that knowledge in application to stem cell therapies. That is amazing. Just the, the potential of this regrowing neurons, where we didn't think that they could really regrow. We're starting to see some inklings of, of evidence that that is possible. And this is, it's really cool that this is right on the, the bleeding edge of the scalpel right here. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a zebrafish lab. We didn't know, I didn't even know we had one here in, in Ogden, Utah. So what kind of are the responsibilities of running a zebrafish lab? Yeah, so um, they don't require quite as much space as some of the larger animal models, which is nice. Um, I still do have nightmares about water leaking out of the room down the hallway. <laughs> but uh, thankfully, I have a whole group of students that help to take care of the fish. They get fed twice a day, a combination of live food and pellets. And the so right. the students feed, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the students feed the fish. We have to be clear about that, um, not the other way around. So the students come in, including Benjamin. Um, they're each assigned a different day and time to take care of the fish, to monitor the health of the fish. Um, we have a system to continuously monitor the water quality and to adjust things like salinity um, as needed. And then the students, uh, since we are working with um, the developing fish for our research, um, because adult fish are hard to visualize under a microscope, uh, the students get to learn and get practice on uh, mating fish, setting up fish to mate identifying males versus females, um, and then um, just familiarity with um, the animal models, why you might use one versus another. And um, they also get to watch the development of the fish in real time. In 30 hours, we have a heart, a beating heart in a fish. So it's, it's quite rapid. What's the uh, actual lifespan of the zebrafish? Yeah, so fish live um, between a year and a half to two years or so. Um, their mating ability gets you know worse the older that they get. 
So when you're looking at them under the microscope, how what age what age bracket do you have to examine them? Yeah, so my uh, we do our experiments in fish that are less than a week old. So at three days, they have the different layers of cell types in the retina. They're finishing up the innervation to, of the brain for that visual information. And we do the injuries at that time point um, because we want to catch them when they're as small as possible and easy to image under the microscope. And so at this time point, they actually don't breathe through, they don't use gills yet. They can exchange gases through their skin. And so we can anesthetize the fish to sedate and immobilize them and actually embed them in a jello-like material. Um, when it's warm, we orient the fish. And then when it cools down, it solidifies and holds the fish exactly how we want it. And we use transgenic fish where different cell types glow different colors so that we can track the specific cells that we're interested in under the microscope. Then we fill that little dish with water um, and, and the more of that sedative, put them under the microscope and then set it to take pictures, you know, periodically up to several hours. Um, and then we can put those images together to make videos. That sounds amazing. I, I mean, when I was in medical school, we studied rats. <laughs> no. yeah, and this, rats definitely have an important place um, yeah. in this research as well. Yeah, this is far more poetic than rats, however. Yeah. What, what do you use as your sedative? So we use tricaine um, as the drug. And um, it's interesting. Scientists still don't know exactly how it works, um, the molecular mechanisms. And there's uh, active research still going on to improve um, what sedatives and painkillers are used for zebrafish research, uh, because it wasn't too long ago that scientists weren't even sure if fish could feel pain. Yeah, I was involved in some research actually in Yellowstone National Park, and we were uh, implanting radio transmitters in some of the uh, Yellowstone cutthroat up on the Lamar mm -hmm. River. And I believe we used clove oil as the yes. sedative there. Yes, that's another very common one. Mm -hmm. This is just blowing my mind. There's so many possibilities and questions mm -hmm. I have. I'm, I'm wondering though, you know, what are some of the, um, I guess, what are the big lessons that um, maybe Benjamin, what have you learned from your research here with Dr. Sandquist? So I've had the opportunity to be with her for the past year, and we have, you know, we've, you first start off by learning how to raise the fish, feed them, take care of them, because that's an important part. It's kind of like housekeeping so that you can do these studies. But then I've learned so much about, you know, different parts of the cell cycle, the life cycle of these fish. And then as you learn about those, you're also able to advance further into learning about how we're able to, you know, view these fish under the microscope using fluorescent antibodies um, and using a confocal microscope. So it's it's a lot of techniques that we've been learning and growing so that I can understand kind of the, you know, this advanced stuff that's going on within the zebrafish retina. But here and there you get you get more and more information and it kind of starts to make sense in your brain. I mean, I'm still an undergraduate trying to trying to grasp the things, right? Yeah. But yeah. you've, you've had to read a lot of primary research articles as mm -hmm. well, and that's something that's a real challenge. It's a lifelong skill, but he's he's gotten to really dive into papers and try to interpret them and ex um, do literature reviews for me, learn about protocols that exist in the field and relate them to our goals. Yeah, it's been amazing. It's been fascinating. So one of the uh, course potentialities for a pre-med student is to love and enjoy the research and propel them into medical school because they wanted that resume item. On the other hand, you can also end up in a more research-oriented track, either with a medical degree or to go into actual pure basic science research. So where are you at on that continuum? <laughs> and before he answers, I will let him know that I am fine with either answer. <laughs> That's good enough. You know, that is a great question. And it's something I've given a lot of thought to. And as of now, what, what kind of drew me towards Dr. Sandquist and neuroscience and research into the zebrafish in the eyes was I have been fascinated for a few years now with, with eyes, vision, 
And when I looked into medical school, I, I, I thought, well, you know, ophthalmology seems like the thing for me, you know. My ideal dream is to continue research throughout medical school, continue into find an institution that does zebra fist research. And it would just be fascinating. And it would be so fulfilling for me to be able to continue the kind of the research that I've guess grown up around <laughs> here in my undergraduate and to, you know, maybe try new techniques, learn new things and continue to advance this research. But of course, I, I hope I hope to get my medical degree to be able to become a practicing physician. But I think it's very important to give back to and, and add to the knowledge that is already out there. And so I think that's one of my main my main goals, along with being a physician one day. Well, that's that's a terrific answer. Well, well spoken. <laughs> and, uh, and certainly the concept of being able to give back is, um, you know, near and dear to the heart of a physician teacher. So so thank you for that answer. So, uh, Dr. Sanquist, one of the challenges, of course, when we're looking at any kind of basic research and hoping to look at clinical trials is some of the legal and practical barriers. So what are you running into as far as difficulties, hurdles to overcome, and where are we at in clinical trials? Yeah, so uh, currently the clinical trials um, for stem cell transplants to the retina are really in the phase one, most of them, just looking at safety, uh, tolerability, and those have been going well. They have a small sample size, but there have been some slight improvements in a few individuals' vision, um, and so it's going in the right direction. The source of the stem cells is always going to be um, an obstacle, uh, whether you use embryonic or adult-derived stem cells. It takes time to prepare the cells for transplant. And a lot of times, even if you are using embryonic stem cells, they like to um, mature or differentiate those stem cells down the lineage of visual of retinal neurons. Because if you transplant embryonic stem cells, um, by their characteristics, they can become anything and they divide a lot. And so we don't want to induce cancers and teratomas in our patients. And so finding ways to efficiently manipulate these cells and prepare them for transplant is really important. With adult-derived stem cells, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, scientists now can take uh, fibroblast skin cells and turn them into a variety of different cell types. Uh, which is really exciting. And so as research continues in that, there's potential that you could actually use your own cells to treat yourself. Mm -hmm. And that will help to avoid a lot of the legal uh, barriers uh, from getting cells from other individuals. Since we're working with the zebrafish, we do have animal care and use committees that uh, make sure that we're being responsible and humane in our research. Stem cell transplant research, um, preclinical uh, trials use um, rodents typically. So any of the knowledge that we glean from zebrafish, I think would be appropriate to then test out in, in mice. That's kind of what I did in medical school um, as I was doing a lot of um, tendon research with, you know, glycation end products and stuff. Uh, just, but it was on rats and mice and mm -hmm. have fun. Um, yeah, short-lived though, they moved yeah. away. <laughs> um, another, obs another obstacle um, with the stem cell therapy that doesn't have so much of a legal or ethical conundrum is um, the actual survival of the cells following transplant. In uh, experiments with mice, they have been able to um, re recover vision. However, when they look at the actual number of cells that survive, where they end up and what they become, it's quite small. And so if we're using really costly methods of harvesting and manipulating cells and then the transplant itself, we want to make sure that these cells are going to survive and integrate properly. And so that's um, kind of the, the point at which I study. So you mentioned, you know, when we transplant these cells themselves, we hope they survive. Can you just briefly describe the actual method of how you transplant these cells? So when uh, cells are transplanted in uh, humans right now, there's two main routes. One is a like a bolus injection of cells, uh, a subretinal injection. So this is going to be um, in between the 
neuronal layers and the retinal pigmented epithelium. The other method is to actually create a sheet of cells on a biocompatible scaffold um, that is almost like a patch. And they would roll it up and insert it into a specially designed syringe. Then that gets inserted into that same area. And once it's uh, inserted, it unfolds. And so that is another really exciting uh, approach, um, which allows to kind of um, start organizing the cells immediately. Well, that sounds very um, mm -hmm. sterile, but we're basically talking about sticking a needle in somebody's eyeball, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I would not want to be awake for that. <laughs> So uh, for, you know, what other applications do you see this technology and this science having? We see it, you know, definitely possible and probable that we'll, we'll see this in our lifetime for the retina. Mm -hmm. But what other applications are out there? What, what, what could we see? Um, so there are scientists that are using zebrafish to tease out what signals actually tell these cells to start dividing and to produce stem cells. So our cells um, respond in anger, in a way, um, and undergo fibrosis and deposit um, scar tissue. And in the zebrafish, they get a little irritated and then they start dividing. And so scientists have been using zebrafish to explore the signals and the gene expression changes. They've actually been able to identify a gene responsible for inducing cell division and turn it on in mice and actually make these cells um, start to divide that normally in mammals do not. So there's also some opportunity for self-repair therapies um, in relation to the visual system. And I focus specifically on diseases of the retina because um, I like neurons, but of course there's many other uh, diseases that impact vision um, that affect other cell types of the eye. So just a question for you personally, why Weber States? Why are you here in our community? Yeah, um, so when I was um, finishing up my postdoc, I, I love research, um, but I also want to be an effective teacher. And um, I found that when you were, when I was at R1 research institutions, that opportunities to practice and excel in teaching were limited. Um, because, you know, there's only so much time in a day. And so I was looking at places where I would be able to teach and that improving and effective teaching would be recognized. And then um, I grew up in the Midwest in Minnesota, my husband as well, and we would go to Colorado on vacations and hike. And we thought, you know, one day when we retire, we're going to live out in the mountains because there's no places you can do research in the mountains. That's just not a thing, right? Yeah. Um, and so I applied to a variety of different institutions and, you know, you Google the town that the university is located in and it showed um, Washington facing north with that um, arch uh, that says, I forget, welcome to Ogden or something like that or pioneer days. And I said, don't get too excited. <laughs> don't get too excited. <laughs> If you're not from the area and you just Google Ogden or Weber State University, we are like nestled right on the foothills of the mountain. And, you know, you could go five minutes and start hiking on a trail. And we've loved um, becoming more outdoorsy people and hiking and visiting the national parks around the state. And so it's it's been a great combination um, for work-life balance. My husband's a corporate pilot. And so living near a larger city is really important. And we're only, you know, 30, 40 minutes away from Salt Lake City. So he was able to find a good job as well. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, we kind of like it for all those same reasons. <laughs> I'm, you, you have good taste. <laughs> Very much. Well, thank you so much. I think our time is just about over with. Um, thank you so much for giving us such a bounteous amount of this new information this is so cool um and it's really really neat that it's happening right here in ogden because i think so, there's some people that that look at weber state and they still think oh well, it's like weber college or it's weber academy even mm -hmm. and like they don't think that real science is done here that you have to go to the u or you have you know and it's really cool that we have this going on here 
Um, yeah, Benjamin was mentioning he gets to use a confocal microscope. This is a very expensive piece of equipment that if you were at a highly research intensive university, you would have to wait till you were in grad school to use. And so because we're a primarily undergraduate institution, students really get some hands-on opportunities. That is really very enjoyable. One just final comment. I do like to fly fish and catch and release. And in the course <laughs> of our research up involved with uh, students at, that are using Yellowstone as a, as a giant outdoor laboratory, we did a number of of studies that involve fin clipping. And it's nice to know that those fish get to grow that back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, thank you for all you do. We're glad to have you in the community. Yes, thanks for the opportunity to share about what we do. I appreciate it. Welcome everyone to the podcast of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society. Today, we have a second unique opportunity to interview our very, very own researchers and students and faculty members at Weber State University in Ogden. These are about some of the latest and newest studies, and we're going to dive into some possibilities of future patient care. Today, we're talking with students and a faculty member in uh, medical laboratory sciences. We have the faculty member is Matthew Nicolau. He is over these students. Um, and Matt, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, yeah, so I'm the chair of medical laboratory sciences. I teach immunology, biostatistics, uh, I help out molecular microbiology, and I oversee the research program and mentor these students. My uh, specialty is in really in HIV and HIV genetics, but I was a clinical microbiologist for many years as well. We're, we're really lucky to have this kind of expertise um, to oversee these students doing this research. And it's amazing. So we have three students working on this project as well. The first one is Ariel Laub. Uh, she is a student in MLS. And, and I've heard that you had a respiratory emergency with a tortoise. Now, I, I don't want to I don't want to make light of it, but please, can you elaborate what you learned from this this summer? Yes. So I have a cute tortoise that turned one this past week and he overheated and he couldn't breathe. And so I had to cool him down, but he's all good. But I realized that I just can't take his little life for granted. He's a cutie. That's good. It's kind of, kind of important in in, uh, uh, in medicine as well. It's kind of like how we deal with, with overheating humans. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then we also have Aubrey Wood. Um, she's also an MLS student. And I hear you like to uh, vacation in Georgia and Florida. Yes. So my brother-in-law and my sister and their kids actually live in uh, Alabama right now. And so we got to go visit them in Smith Station, Georgia. And then we drove down to Florida. And it was a lot of fun because I got to meet my nephew and niece who are twins. And then last but not least, we have Sydney Boyer. Um, she is also an MLS student. Um, and this summer, I'm I'm a little bit... Uh, partial to this because she got to spend in Europe and Spain and Germany. Um, that's an amazing place to be. So, you know, what was it like? Where would you go? What'd you do? Yeah, so I befriended some international students at Weber State. And so when the semester o was over, we all planned a trip to visit them and they toured us around. We stayed at their house. And so we kind of got that one on one uh, experience to see like what life is like in Barcelona or Germany. So that was a great experience for sure. This is very cool and useful, I think, um, to be able to compare between the two. Um, I, I know it was for me at least. So now we want to try to get down to the nitty gritty of this, of this podcast. Um, here's where I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about your research and how it applies to medicine in our community. So First off, I just want to know, like, why did you even decide to take a research class? So I guess for me, I was really interested in doing something a little bit different. And I heard great things about the research program from faculty who were in the same program and had done it when they were in it. And I thought it would be really interesting to do something new and learn more about something I'd maybe never thought about. So again, more cool things happening all around campus. Now, you chose a really interesting topic 
on food dyes. So food dyes, I mean, how, how do you come up with food dyes? I mean, that's just a common thing that we have in the world nowadays. So what, I mean, what is the food dye? What does it do? And tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so America in generally has a lot of synthetic colorants in all the food. It's very common. So we wanted to choose a topic that, you know, would affect everyday life because it's so common in our diet. So we kind of did some research on what the common ones are, like the most commonly used. The FDA only has seven approved to be used. So we picked Brilliant Blue, which is not natural in any way. <laughs> uh, and then we did Allura Red and Tartrazine, and then lastly, Curcumin. Now, uh, so those are... Those are, are definitely not natural. Um, well, maybe, I mean, curcumin sounds pretty natural. But do they have positive or negative health effects to them? I mean, it, they could be positive. I don't yes. know. So I know the curcumin, that's used in, like, the turmeric supplement. So that one, I know, can be recommended, and people take that part of their, like, daily vitamins. But the other food dyes that we tested, those are kind of, like, in the Skittles and the Gushers and all that stuff. So And... I think the group uh, overall were looking at these food dyes and things that were, you know, common to diets of, you know, people in the United States. And the FDA approves them mostly based on toxicity through a various number of assays and maybe some carcinogenic, immunogenic effects, perhaps. But their interest was more kind of indirect in thinking, okay, well, Maybe the dyes don't have a direct, uh, you know, toxicity to the cells of a human body, but what about the other organisms that are living within your body, like in your GI system or in your oral microflora? And could those dyes be actually kind of secondarily affecting those environments that then relate into a, a like direct health problem in those individuals? So the FDA screening of the compound itself is, is one thing, but how that is affecting this whole micro environment that is every human beating being's body is a different thing, right? And that's usually not assessed uh, as far as those drug safety things. And that's kind of what they saw as an opportunity to, uh, to study. So of course, one of the challenges for the everyday consumer is the presence of things you do not suspect. Right. So <laughs> could you give some examples of things that we normally would eat that may have dyes in them that we wouldn't suspect. I mean, Skittles, you can look at, you know, those are dyed. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Lucky Charms, you know, those are dyed. But what about, what about the stealth dyes? Oh, so did you guys uh, find any examples of things where, you know, like, again, like maybe very artificial foods, uh, you know, maybe I'm eating it and no, I'm eating bad things, but, you know, drinks or even commercial products that they just are adding it to make it more appealing, right? Um, I remember we did some research and we found that Aftershave had, I can't remember which one it was, I think it was the Brilliant Blue, Blue right. had a little bit of in it. And so when there was mechanical damage to the skin, there was research done that the Aftershave has some dyes in it. So moral of the story, you know, there's a lot of things, I think. I mean, it's it's hard to point out maybe specifics, but the idea is that uh, manufacturers are trying to always, you know, make a product more appealing to the consumer, right? And by adding these dyes, we just are tricking our brains into thinking, oh, this is like, you know, an actually really red apple or some kind of, you know what I mean? Like some more appealing set of responses to that product. You know, why is aftershade blue? I don't know. I'm sure some focus group decided that blue <laughs> seemed cleaner and better. Um, but how those then, you know, sneak into either the diet or a product and then what we use it for is, is really tricky. I mean, it's hard for a consumer to look on the package insert or the label of everything they're purchasing, right? Um, again, why we kind of chose some of these common dyes and hopefully, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's that's definitely that it's almost fear invoking. It's like, oh, well, now I got to check everything I'm eating, and really, I guess I should know kind of what the ingredients list are. You know, ingredient of an apple is an apple, but the right. ingredient list on on you know. Uh, well, and, but, you know, again, that that apple example. I mean, they're picked before they're ripe. They're treated with chemicals to sterilize and artificially, you know, make them last to shipping and. 
you know, there's no label for that. So there's all kinds of things in our society that we don't see per se um, that are being included or induced. And, you know, at some level have been reviewed for safety, but sometimes not in the exact way it should have been or covering all the things that possibly it could affect. Yeah, it's the, thank you for opening up Pandora's box. Yeah, so to extend that, then a question for you ladies is, uh, has this research changed your behavior in any way as far as your diets? Um, I think definitely has made me more aware and maybe seek out those products that don't have the dye, including food and just skin products. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it's very hard to find those products that just don't have those chemicals in it they just seem to be everywhere yeah. like plastics i mean one of the things you guys looked at uh was it the brilliant blue um and the Ames test right that you did i mean that one was you know a little more worrying i don't know if we wanted to go into specifics of some of the assays they carried out but they did do two that were, you know, essentially one set of assays were looking at the, the growth rate and, you know, how you were affecting these uh, microbial kind of populations in the gut or oral uh, spaces. But then another test essentially was looking at the, just the basic mutagenic properties of these dyes. And the one was more mutagenic than, or just as mutagenic as ethidium bromide, which is a you know fluorescently labeled DNA intercalating dye we use for molecular assays that is super nasty and that you have like all these warning signs on but then here's this food dye that apparently is doing the same thing in this kind of you know experiment essentially to see how much it mutates these bacteria so again the dyes might not have that much effect on people or or you know mammalian cells but in these environments and in these microorganisms they seem to have a pretty pretty profound effect so that's, you know, a little worrisome, kind of crazy. Well, here we are right before I'm going to go get lunch. Maybe I'll, <laughs> maybe I'll just fast today. <laughs> just pull a carrot out of the ground and eat that, right? There that's you go. <laughs> yeah. I think we found out that Brilliant Blue is the most mutagenic. So as long as you stay away from the color blue, you're probably yeah. fine. <laughs> right. Just don't eat blue things. No blue things. Well, there goes my uh, Sour Patch Kids that I ate. <laughs> <laughs> or a Slurpee. I mean, I love a blue Slurpee. Man, Lay off the squeezes. <laughs> yeah, no. All those things. Now, we now know that there are some, some definitely deleterious pr properties of these dyes. What are kind of the more common, because um, I'm assuming that all the dyes don't have the same problems with them. Right. I'm wondering, you know, kind of what some common themes are. What could you say to the physician audience that, you know, these food dyes will likely cause what issues? Maybe down long term or short term? So with our experiment, we did the bacteria, tested them individually, so it didn't accurately represent the whole microbiome as a whole. After doing data analysis and cleaning the data, we found zero patterns. <laughs> I was doing some analysis and there wasn't a single dye that inhibited the growth of all the organisms or like one bacteria that was affected by all the dyes, those cases did not happen. But what was interesting is what we found was P. acnes increased its growth with the dye. That's something like we did not expect with this experiment. So maybe they could be a little helpful, but then again, more growth may not be good for you either. Right. So overall, the the different dyes had very differential effects on these different organisms, right? So here's a complex microenvironment full of, you know, hundreds to thousands of types of uh, different species of bacteria, but these dyes really do, I mean, the, the take home is whether there's a pattern of it going up or down, uh, the take home is that it altered the growth of most, if not all of the organisms we tested to some degree, right? And so you're taking in these dyes and you are altering that environment or, you know, the natural, uncontrolled, undyed, you know, organism itself. What's tough and what really would be, you know, the next step, I think, in the research would say, you know, how in an organism or in a person is this really relating to health? And it's a little bit 
of a chicken and an egg scenario because you know if we were to go measure a bunch of people's microbiomes you know are those populations there in those in those amounts because they eat lots of food dye or not is, is a fairly tough question because almost none of us eat a dye that's free of it right so it's really hard to establish baselines in these kinds of things, which, you know, we took a little nibble on this kind of problem to see if essentially it had this effect, and they do. But now the next step would be how do we, you know, experimentally create a scenario where we can say, okay, this is what a, you know, quote unquote, normal microbiome is, and then in this unexposed, undyed environment, and then this is what happens when we add that in. And so, you know, I think nutritional dietary studies are notoriously difficult, right? You can't lock people in rooms for two months and just, I mean, you try sometimes, but you can't like completely regulate their intakes, right? That's very challenging. So I'm, I'm sure at some level, uh, you know, somebody's going to try to do this at some time because it is. It's one of those things I think as we open our eyes, you know, kind of like microplastics and all this stuff, like we didn't realize until we started looking that, oh, look, there's these little pieces of plastics everywhere on the top of Everest and in our water, everywhere you look, right? So I think when you kind of have this new thing that you see, there's some kind of effect these dyes might be having, you know, trying to pull out the, the finite health impacts is, is difficult, but, you know, that's, that's the, next, the next question. That's why we do research, right? Something else is we didn't just do dye bacteria, we did the dye at different concentrations to see if like, if you limited, you know, your intake of a certain dye, would that be helpful? And then we found no significant difference between the limits or concentration of the dye. Right. And then sometimes we did increase the concentration for what is approved as the daily intake dose that's normal. So we kind of went above that and below that to kind of get a good range. Um, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> if it has an effect, even a small amount will do something, which is interesting. So I have a historical question. I seems like the red dye when I was a child was eventually taken off the market. And I'm wondering why have some dyes been removed? Ooh, I think we would have to look up the specific one because they do have, like you, like you're saying, there are very a couple different compounds, right, for these different pigments or these dyes. Um, I think I remember reading about that at some point. Most of the time, and I don't know specifically which one it would be, right, but the red dye. But most of the time, they're eventually found to have long-term health effects, right? I mean, I think sometimes. When you're assessing safety, you don't do it for five or 10 or 15 years, right, to, to see if it's safe. You have a, a mathematical and, you know, kind of trial set up to kind of impute some of that information. But sometimes we just won't know until people are exposed for a period of time or, you know, a lot, let's say, over a period of time. And that makes some kind of difference. So I'm just, I can't remember exactly, but I assume that's usually kind of when we, when we get to that level of like, oh, we thought this was fine, but now it's been a little while. And now we see these effects, right? Um, I wish I could give you the right answer, though. Okay. Kind of like thalidium. Thalidium. Oh, there you go. I think we kind of did a little bit of research into that, and it was just kind of like to, like you said, like other health issues, like organ damage or cancers and things. And so they were ultimately the ones that were just removed. Yeah, they they showed up to have some toxicity at some level um, over time. Thank you so much. This is a great study project that kind of opens our eyes because, you know, it, it doesn't prove anything, but it, it, I mean, these types of research projects are so important because they allow us to be able to focus more on the things that, that matter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we realize that, oh yeah, maybe, so food dyes, maybe not, not the best. Maybe we do need to take stuff off the market or maybe we need to stop adding stuff to food. Maybe we, you know, we don't know what this is, but we're constantly fine tuning our existence here. Um, and this is this is another way to improve our lives on this planet. So thank you guys for doing this research. Yes, thank you very much. It's fun. <laughs> cool. And thank you guys for being interested in it. That was, that was